I've been teaching now for 25 years, and I'm really kind of proud of that, to have my sil silver anniversary of teaching. I started teaching high school chemistry and physics in 1986. I've taught physical science, I've taught junior high math, I've taught college chemistry, and I have taught teachers for a lot of my career. If you think back to 1986, the world was very different. Um, there was no internet. So I walked into my classroom, I didn't have an internet. If you think back to 1986, we were still in the middle of the Cold War. Um, we weren't in this massive period of globalization that we're in now. You couldn't really get on a plane and go anywhere nearly as easily as you could today. And there certainly weren't any cell phones. Now, if you think about my classroom in 1986, and then you think about how kids today are probably learning chemistry and physics or in any classroom today, you're probably thinking that the classroom is very different today than it was 25 years ago. But that's actually wrong because the world has changed, but teaching really hasn't in American schools. As I look back over these last 25 years, teach, the American education system has really just stagnated. Let me show you some of the things that I've learned over these last 25 years that have helped me see that. Um, my field is math and science, trying to prepare kids for life and work in a global economy where they're having to go head to head with kids from all around the world, especially in math and science fields. Well, in 1995, we, we had the, the third international math and science study. It was really the first study that I saw in my career that really helped us see how well kids in American schools were doing compared with their peers around the world. And kids weren't doing, our kids were not doing well in math and science. They were, well, if you look up here, you can probably see the United States at the bottom. We're at the tail end of the list. Now, have you noticed at the top of this graphic who we're talking about? We're talking about the top 5% of physics students. We're not talking about the run-of-the-mill students. And you may have known some of these students. These were our AP physics students, probably. And they were almost dead last in the world. Our best and our brightest, our science geeks, performed very poorly. And studies continued after 1995, continued to show that in math and science we were doing poorly. Here's pretty much the gold standard for international comparisons now. It's the PISA study. This is 2009. PISA looks at eighth graders to make sure we have a fair comparison around the world. Eighth grade is the age that, many, that in most countries compulsory, compulsory education stops. So looking around the world, looking at how America did, in math and science, remember math and science opens the doors to so many technical careers like engineering today. We're not doing well. You can see the blue line up there, that's the average. In math, we're below average. In science, we're above average, but only by one point. And then, so you, when you look back, we're kind of in the middle, but let me also show you the bottom of the list. And most Americans, when they look at the countries that are at the, toward the bottom of the list, we look at those countries and we're seeing the kind of countries that we really don't consider our peers because we invest so much more in education. So as I look at this list and I look at our peers, we're still at the bottom in math and science. Let's look, uh, let's look at our nation itself and what happens around our nation. This is the NAEP, and all of these studies are available online. You can find them easily and look these up. Look at how the studies were done and see whether they're fair or not. The NAEP is the nation's report card, the National um, Assessment of Educational Progress. And when you look at the NAEP, let's look at how kids do in our state. You can see that the NAEP talks about whether kids are proficient. Think proficient as proficient it is as they can compete in a global economy. And then there's basic, which isn't profi proficient. And you're probably seeing from up here that about half of our kids in our state are performing at below basic. And I think we're closing doors for kids. If you look around the country, we have massive massively different educational systems. I just looked at the M's in the list, 
and you can look at the M's in the list and you can see this amazing variation. It's good to be a kid in Massachusetts. In Massachusetts, kids get a good chance to become proficient. About 40% of the kids are proficient and ready to compete. But I grew up in Mississippi. In Mississippi, you've got a very low chance of being ready to compete, to take a good job, to hold on to a good job. And to me, when we look at our system, when I look back over 25 years and when I look at how we're doing, I can't help but thinking we simply have a mediocre system. And that's often a tough thing for Americans to grasp onto, that our system of education provides stu students with mediocre education. We often think as Americans, we can do better than that. And I honestly think we can. Is there hope? Absolutely. We are growing solutions. So in all that dead space, growing solutions around the country and in our state, let me tell you some of the things that are really, really working, and they're working in our city. Um, one thing is Amstai. This project puts kit-based science in schools around Alabama. And I want you to look at some of these faces of the kids of Amstai. And I think you can take one look and you can tell she's engaged, right? She's learning and she's enjoying it. How about her? Having fun, engaged, learning. This is kit-based science. It delivers kits out to schools. And we have these huge warehouses around our states where these kits are refurbished, they're, all the materials are put back in once they've been used and they're sent out again, and it works. Except less than 50% of the kids in our state have access to this kind of learning. In many of the schools, they're still only getting textbook-based science, and you won't see those kinds of smiles and engagement in that kind of classroom. My specialty is inquiry-based science at the high school level. So the last time I was in the classroom learning to do inquiry by myself, I did something called cartoon physics. We had done Newton's third laws and three laws, and you would probably heard of Newton's laws. And then I told the kids, I want you to watch cartoons and find out how they break Newton, Newton's laws. Well, this is 2001 or so. One of my students looked at the Powerpuff Girls, and she saw how the Powerpuff Girls were flying through the air, and she was able to apply her understanding of physics to see how it broke the laws, broke second, the second laws. Another one of my students looked at, if you remember the movie, Angels in the Outfield. And she saw how there was all these mysterious movie forces and they were breaking the laws. And they were, my kids were getting how science helps them understand the world. There is even a whole curriculum that's built for that. It's called active physics. Um, fantastic curriculum project, and yet only 23% of American kids take physics. And we're not getting any more kids using this kind of inquiry-based science. There's something called Science Notebooks. It's another one of those growing solutions that's really working to get kids ready for, for science and math. Um, this, are, this is actual work from kids in Orlando, Florida, Orange County Schools. And if you look at this, you get to see inside kids' heads, and you can see kids understanding science. I work with teachers around the country. This is a group, this is some teachers from Orlando. And since they've never learned by inquiry, I actually do inquiry with them. They get excited, and then their kids get to learn by inquiry, and it works. One of the teachers asked a kid, what's a system? And look at the system the kid realized, a radio alarm clock how it's a system in science. Science Notebooks is another one of those things that works and works beautifully. Teachers report all around the country. It really helps kids learn. But you may be familiar that we're under No Child Left Behind. And under No Child Left Behind, this kind of assessment isn't allowed. We can only use paper and pencil and pretty much multiple choice tests. Well, this also works in math. I got to take part in a project here where I had to relearn how to do math. I've taken differential equations and calculus, and I was put back in algebra to learn how kids really learn math. Well, let me give you a second to, to do this yourself. So 14 times seven, go ahead. Most adults, unless you're young enough to have learned math differently, most adults are going 14 times seven, seven times four, 28, eight, eight, carry the two, seven times, wait, was it two? Yeah, yeah, wait. Let me show you what kids do, and this is what fourth graders do. 
They take numbers, they flip them around in their heads, they can look at them all different ways, and so they look at 14 and say, oh, 14, well, that's 10 plus 4. And then they know off the top of their heads, 7 times 10 is 70, 7 times 4 is 28, and they just know 70 plus, 70 plus 28 is 98. They just take one look and almost instantly they know that the answer is 98. I could take you around this city into classrooms where fourth and fifth graders would astound us as adults with the mathematics that they know. And that would be almost all kids in the classroom with the mathematics that they know. And many adults in those classrooms don't understand what the kids are saying. The math goes over the adults' heads because the kids are so good at it. And this is almost every kid in the classroom. And yet, there is massive nationwide opposition to this kind of mathematics teaching wherever it goes. And we want to go back to the old way. And remember what we got in the old way? American kids scoring below average in the world? It even works in history. So how do you learn history through inquiry? Well, on the AP history test, kids have to do what's called document analysis. So most of us learned history by lecture. When actually, if you look at this, in what ways did African Americans shape the course and consequence of the Civil War? And the kids have to answer that by looking at documents. And more documents. And more documents. Oh, and more documents. And more documents. They don't learn by listening to a lecture. They learn by analyzing history the way historians do from documents. And it works. I watched my sons learn um, AP history this way. And there are projects that are taking this kind of document analysis to every kid because you can see some of their values there because they begin to realize all kids can think and all kids can learn. And yet, most American kids don't have access to this. There's even thousands of research studies. You could Google this book, How People Learn, and you can read a little bit from my field, we know how kids learn. And we know that these are masterful innovations of how kids learn. And yet they're not being used. So let me step back with you. I want to give you a visual metaphor of what I think is going on in education as I look over 25 years. These are some trees down the road from my house. There are two oak trees there at the front. And these oak trees have been deformed. Can you see it? Because their world has changed. The power lines came in. There's nothing wrong with power lines. And these trees have been topped. I love oak trees. I grew up in the oak forest of North Mississippi. They're, to me, a symbol of giants. And this is obscene to me. And to me, these are the trees of traditional education where we keep trying to hang on to the past and it's not working. So let me tell you some things that you can do. Some things, some ways that you can put pressure on the system and call for changes because you're probably not all teachers like I am. So what can you do? Well, let me blue sky with you a little bit. Here's some things that you can do to wake the giant of education. These trees that grow over kids and give them a shady spot to develop and develop strong minds. They can come from actions that we can take, like this one. Working with public schools and just simply demanding that all kids in all our public schools speak two languages. We are nowhere close to that in America's education system. In a global economy where kids need languages to sell and buy and trade. Here's another one. All college-bound kids take calculus. Ooh, a lot of Americans are thinking, oh, no. But as soon as a college-bound kid doesn't take calculus, he or she has shut the doors to engineering, probably. And engineering is the hot field of the future. Why would we let kids not take calculus? Why would we let them opt out? Or why would we not teach science every single year? Because again, in a science-saturated society like we live in now, and in a global economy, science opens doors. And if you don't understand science, you close doors. And yet, under No Child Left Behind, we've stopped teaching science in most elementary schools. 
focusing only on reading and math. And you remember the faces of the kids of Anstey and how engaging science is. Here's another one that you can do. All kids are, kids are fluent in technology. Well, guess what that takes? You know, that takes hardware. That takes computers, tablets, being put in schools everywhere. And most kids in our state don't have access to that kind of technology. And we can advocate for that together. We can demand it together. It's going to cost something, though. We're going to have to put, but if kids don't have that kind of fluency in technology, they've shut the doors to careers because people don't want to hire them if they can't do technology. This is my dad. He was a superintendent of schools. And I went to school on his system. And I learned well. My dad had a, had a motto that he ran to schools by. And I really like it. Hire good teachers and get out of their way. Most of you aren't teachers. It's not teachers. It's not your place. It, you're not, you don't have the expertise in the classroom. But everything I've talked about before, about pushing for technology, pushing for foreign language, pushing for all these changes, that's perfectly appropriate from outside. And then leave it to us teachers to figure it out. But here is one thing that you should ask questions about, and it's about No Child Left Behind. As I look over 25 years, No Child Left Behind, our federal push for a quality education has devastated the American classroom because it focuses only on test taking. And that's one thing that I would encourage you to do, find a teacher and ask questions about the devastating effect of No Child Left Behind on creativity, engagement, and learning in the classroom. So can we wake the giant? Absolutely. We can work together. But there's one final message that I think that's hidden in the shadows here, and that's what if we don't? We are bordering on the immoral, and that is something that is happening in my soul right now is when we don't protect kids and give them the opportunity to really learn, what are we doing to children? And isn't that immoral? But remember, kids are getting a mediocre education, but there are all kinds of innovations that work, but we've got to break with the past. We've got to stop looking over our shoulder, and we've got to look to the future where these innovations work and getting every kid access. Thank you.